Hallelujah, hallelujah. Welcome, welcome to Hebrew Institute Rosh Hashanah Seder on this awesome, awesome Rosh Hashanah and the beginning of our Shemitah year. This is a year of release, the year of Yahweh's favor. You are in Yahweh's favor. Hallelujah. Hallelujah, hallelujah. If everybody could go to your program and the first thing we're going to do is pray the Rosh Hashanah prayer. That's on the, I think, last page. Hallelujah. Thank you, Lord. Hallelujah. 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 Are we okay? All right. Hallelujah. All together now. We will observe the mighty holiness of this day. For it is one of awe and anxiety. There is your dominion exalted. On this day, we conceive you established on your throne of mercy, sitting in truth. We behold you as judge and witness, recording our secret thoughts and acts and setting the seal thereon. You record everything. Yea, you remember the things forgotten. You unfold the records. And the deeds written there tell their own story, for every man's signature is there. The great shofar is sounded, and a still small voice is heard. The angels in heaven are dismayed and are seized with fear and trembling as they proclaim, Behold, the day of judgment, for the host of heaven are to be arraigned in judgment. For in your eyes, even they are not free from guilt. All who enter the world, you cause to pass before you, one by one, as a flock of sheep. As a shepherd musters his sheep and causes them to pass beneath his staff, so do you pass and record, count and visit every living soul, appointing the measure of every creature's life and decreeing its destiny. But repentance, prayer, and righteousness avert the severity of the decree. You are slow to anger and ready to forgive. You do not seek the death of the sinner, but that he return from his evil way and live. Even until his dying day, you wait for him. Perhaps he will repent and you will gratefully receive him. True, you as creator know the nature of man for he is but flesh and blood. Man's origin is dust, and he returns to the dust. He obtains his bread by the peril of his life. He is like a fragile potsherd, as the grass that withers, as the flower that fades, as a fleeting shadow, as a passing cloud, as the wind that blows, as the floating dust, and as a dream that vanishes. But you are our living an all-powerful God and King, Lashana Tova. And may your name be found written in the Lamb's Book of Life, this Rosh Hashanah. Hallelujah! 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 All right, you may be seated, Miss Jenny. You will walk in my spirit of excellence. All right now. You will know that I, the Lord, am your Savior and your Redeemer, the Mighty One of Jacob. The sun shall no longer be your light by day, nor for brightness shall the moon give light to you. But I will be to you an everlasting light and your glory. Though you may be hard-pressed on every side, you will not be crushed. When you are perplexed, I will not forsake you. If you are struck down, you will not be destroyed. By faith you will know that just as I raised up my son Yeshua, I will also raise you up with Yeshua and will bring you before my throne in heaven. Therefore, do not lose heart, for your light affliction, which is but for a moment, is working for you a far more eternal victory. Do not look on the things that you see, but look at those things that are not seen. Because the Spirit of God is at work within us, we are empowered to walk in the excellence of God. When troubling and perplexing circumstances come into our lives, we will not lose heart. 
We will not look at things as they are seen, but we will look at the unseen power of God. We will place our eyes on our Father's throne in heaven, and as we walk in his excellence, his spirit will enable us to radiate his glory. Amen. I have to stand up, otherwise uh, Brad will hit me with the microphone. We're going to go over the themes for this holy time. We call it Rosh Hashanah. That's how people commonly call it, the head of the year. But the real name, biblical name, is Yom Teruah, okay, the day of the trumpets, the day of the memorial of trumpets. Did anyone ever think about that? It's a memorial of trumpets. But for a memorial means there's something you have to remember. Am I right? And we're remembering trumpets. But I bet no one ever thought about that. We just go, we just go through the theme. See, people already throwing stuff at me. Okay. <laughs> I'm sorry. Okay. Okay. You know, it, it, it is a day where we never really, we've read these themes year after year. But have we really, really thought about what they were? So let's go over them. It is teshuva, repentance. Repentance. Now, when we talk about Rosh Hashanah, the head of the year, the birthday of the world, this is the day that is typically said that God created Adam. Because there was really no need to mark time I know the cows don't, you know, wonder what time is it? You know, is it time to eat? You know, is the grass growing right? Do I go out and throw seed on the ground or whatever? No, there was no need for marking time until there was a what? A man. So this represents the birth of Adam. Now, I want you to think about we're back where? Genesis chapter 1, Genesis chapter 2. And what comes after Genesis chapter 2? <laughs> That ugly little incident, okay, with the serpent. But here's where our themes become important. Because of, if this is the day, since this is the day Adam was created, what also happened on that day? Animals were created. What else happened on that day? The day he was created, what happened? He sinned. Okay, so let's the dominoes start falling in, okay? Because when we talk about, once again, the day of trumpets, a memorial of trumpets, when was the last time we had a memorial? We have to remember something. So when was the last occasion that trumpets were very important? Trumpets were front and center in our minds. Let's go back. Oh, come on now. Oh, yeah. Clue. Mount Sinai. Okay. Okay. You're right. You're right. Okay. So a blowing of the memorial of trumpets brings you back to Mount Sinai. And it is to remember. What do we remember? Why were the trumpets blowing? What were we doing at Mount Sinai? So Rosh Hashanah is a memorial of what happened at Mount Sinai, the trumpets. And what else did we happen at Mount Sinai? We received the Torah at Mount Sinai. We entered into the covenant at Mount Sinai. We accepted God as king at Mount Sinai. We became a kingdom of priests at Mount Sinai. So what is this day reminding us of? Who we are, who he is, he is our king, okay? And it was at Mount Sinai that we became what? A kingdom of priests, a holy nation with God as our king. It is actually the time we entered into what? The kingdom of God. Because a kingdom has what? A king. A king has what? Subjects. A king has what? Laws. And a king has what? A place. 
So Rosh Hashanah is reminding us of who we are. We are a covenant people. It was a time of joy. But let's not stop at Rosh Hashanah. Because with it being, okay, the birthday of the world, we have to go back even further. It is reminding us also of what happened in the garden how we sinned, but what did God do for us? He redeemed us. He redeemed us. It was a day of judgment. Man was judged. Satan, the serpent, was judged. So when we're looking at these themes and we start going backwards, the themes begin to make sense. So it is a day of teshuvah, repentance. Now, we went back to Mount Sinai, but another thing also happened at Mount Sinai. We entered into the covenant, but what else happened at Mount Sinai? The golden calf. Okay, what happened in the garden? We sinned in the garden. We were a people made by God. We sinned in the garden. What happened at Mount Sinai? We were a people unto God. We sinned. Oh, come on now. You understand the patterns that he's trying to get us to remember? Yom Teruah, the day of the awakening blast, the feast of trumpets. Now, here's the whole thing. On Mount Sinai, it doesn't say the shofar sounded. There was a sound like a shofar. And people did not see God, but they heard the voice. Let's go back a little further in the garden. What did Adam and Eve hear in the garden? The voice of God walking in the garden. The chauffeur is always associated with the voice of God. We are a people of hearing. Shema Israel means what? Doesn't mean see, O Israel. It means hear, O Israel. As opposed to the church, we were always looking for a sign to what? But as a people, what is most important, what is the most important of our senses that we have? Hearing. And that is why the trumpets, the voice of God, the day of judgment, the original day of judgment happened on Rosh Hashanah. When man sinned, and what happened? There was judgment. The serpent was judged. There was judgment. The ground was cursed. Man was kicked out of the garden. So we have a day of judgment, a day of judgment where actually Hasatan becomes the prosecuting attorney. We see that in the book of Job. We always need to understand Hasatan or the Satan. Okay, Satan simply means one who is opposing, one who is in opposition. Even Peter was called Satan by Yeshua. So at any point in time, who can be the biggest Satan you are fighting? Ourselves. (laughs) Ourselves, okay? So it is a day of judgment. It is the day, Hamalek, the coronation of the king, coronation of the Messiah. We accepted God as king at Mount Sinai. And what he's saying? I want you to remember me. That's what the blowing of the trumpet is. It's a memorial. I want you to remember that. The church has us waiting for a future kingdom. But the feast of the Lord are to remind us we're already in the kingdom. Hallelujah. We are a kingdom people. It is Yom Hazikaron, the day of remembrance or memorial, which is what we are doing now. Remembering, remembering. Listen, if I go back to the garden, I don't just remember the sin. I remember the blessing. God blessed me and said, go take dominion. Have power over all of his creation. See, too often we remember what? The bad things. But it is a day of remembering God gave us good things. And even if bad things happen, what is the key to reversing that? 
repentance, which is the first one on our list. Now, we also have the time of Jacob's trouble or the birth pangs of the Messiah. As we were reading, okay, that prayer, I hope when we were reading it, you should begin to recognize certain things in the Bible. I want you to go back over again and read it when you go home. And I want you to think of Matthew chapter 25, where this is a time of, once again, he's judging. We talked about you judge your sheep. Okay, Matthew 25, what does he do? He separates the sheep from the goats. Matthew 25 is all about Rosh Hashanah. It begins with the bride and what? The bridegroom is coming. And what do they do? Blow the trumpet. So this is the time where the bride, the bridegroom comes for the bride and they enter in. Okay? It is also the time of the opening of the gates. Gates of heaven are open. Gates are places where decisions are made. And all who enter in that gate are bound by those decisions. It is Kiddushin Nesuin, the wedding ceremony. Hello, Matthew chapter 25. We's married. <laughs> okay, guys, we's married. All right, it's the wedding ceremony. It's also the resurrection of the dead. Hello, Paul, and your last trump. Okay, as a matter of fact, that is the name of today, the last trump. So you have those sitting around waiting for a rapture to come. They don't know when it's going to come. They have to be ready every day. But the Bible, see, when you don't study Torah, you start getting crazy stuff. As opposed, Paul wasn't crazy. Paul said what? At the last trump, the dead in Christ shall rise. And we that are alive and remain shall be caught up together with him, which is why this is called the day of the resurrection of the dead. So if the rapture is taking place, guys, we're all left behind. Come on, we're all left behind if the rapture has already taken place, all right? The last trump, and then it is Yom Hakaseh. Why the hidden day? The reason it is the hidden day is because this festival, this feast, this holy time is the only one of the festival that falls on the first day of the month. The day which no man knows the hour or the day, but who? My father in heaven. You see. So that's why. Okay, you know, when you think about all of these themes that we have here, it is a day, Yom Zikaron Teruah, the day of remembering the trumpet. We remember we are a kingdom people. We are a holy nation. We are a kingdom of priests. We are blessed by God. He is our king. We are in his kingdom, and we are a blessed people. Hallelujah. Okay, that's what we are to remember. So you remember how we were always before, it's a day of judgment and so fearful, okay, so fearful. But see, that's still residual of our church mindset. Always looking to be judged, always waiting for Thor to throw down his hammer on our head. Come on. But God, in his grace and in his mercy, I want you to remember, remember what I did in the garden. Yeah, you sinned, but what did I do for you? When you couldn't redeem yourself, I redeemed you. Remember what I did at Mount Sinai. Yeah, that was that golden calf, and I was real mad, but there was an intercessor there that prayed and reminded me of my promise that I made to your father, so I did not destroy you. Only those who did the deed. And then we go all the way. To Luke chapter 4, like we talked about on Shabbat, where Yeshua stands up, okay, after being given the scroll of Isaiah and saying, quoting Isaiah chapter 61, the spirit of Adonai Yahweh is upon me because Yahweh has anointed me to preach the gospel to the poor. 
He has sent me to the broken hearted, to preach deliverance to the captives and the recovering of sight to the blind, to set at liberty them that are bruised, and to preach the acceptable year of Yahweh. The acceptable year of Yahweh is the Shemitah year. Hallelujah. Come sundown. We are entering in the Shemitah year, the year of release, the year of redemption. Hallelujah. The year of Yahweh's favor. The year of Yahweh's favor. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. So with that, we're going to start the rest of our, our uh, program here. Our next reading will be by, I think, Miss Connie. And um, where are you at, Connie? <laughs> All right. Tell everybody where you're from. Unmute yourself. Can you hear me now? Yes, we can. Okay. <laughs> Let me start off again. Connie from Las Vegas, Roshan Hassan, the head of the year, birthday of the world. Roshan Hassan, I'm so sorry, my words are going together, I'm nervous. <laughs> Rosh, Rosh, <laughs> Lord help me. So now marks the Jewish New Year and is part of the season of repentance. Rosh is Hebrew meaning chief of chief of head or head. Shana means year. Rosh Shana is the end of the year on the civil calendar. It is also known as the birthday of the world since the world was created. On this day, that belongs to the moon, Rosh Hashanah 11a. Tradition believes that Adam was created on this day. Mm-mm-mm. Hmm. Mishka, uh, Hadrian 38b, how they decided that this was the day of the year the world was created because the first words of the book of Genesis in the beginning when changed around read Huh? Petitioning? <laughs> Aleph Petitre. Okay. Aleph Petitre. On the first of Tishre, therefore, Rosh Hashanah is known as the birth of the world, for tradition tells us that the world was, the world was created for it. <laughs> time of observance. observance. Rosh Hashanah is observed for two days. It comes on the first and second days of the month of Tishri, usually September or October, which is the first month of the biblical civil calendar. The month of Tishri is the seventh month in the biblical religious calendar. This may seem strange that the Rosh Hashanah, the new year, is on the first and second day of Tishri, the seventh month on the biblical religious calendar. The reason that Rosh Hashanah is the seventh month in the biblical religious calendar is that God made the month Nisan and Abib the first month of the year in remembrance of Israel's divine liberation from Egypt, Exodus 12.2 and 13.4. However, according to tradition, the world was created on Tishri, or more exactly, Adam and Eve were created on the first day of Tishri, and it is from Tishri that the annual cycle began. Hence, Rosh Hashanah is celebrated at this time. And I'm going to go look and see if we have a new moon. Happy New Year! Happy New Year! Hey, this is, this is
is Renee from North Carolina. Hallelujah. Right. Now the question is, why is Rosh Hashanah two days long? Unlike other festivals that are celebrated in the diaspora, the dispersion referring to those who live outside of the Holy Land of Israel, Rosh Hashanah is celebrated for two days because of uncertainty about observing the festivals on the correct calendar day. Rosh Hashanah is the only holiday celebrated for two days in Israel. As with all other festivals, the uncertainty was involved in a calendar that depended on when the new moon was promulgated, designating the beginning of each new month by the rabbinical court in Jerusalem, Yerushalayim, in ancient times. The problem of Rosh Hashanah is heightened by the fact that it falls on Rosh HaKadosh, the new moon itself. Therefore, even in Jerusalem, Yerushalayim, it would have been difficult to let everyone know in time that the new year had begun. To solve this problem, a two-day Rosh Hashanah was practiced even in Israel. Creating a two-day Rosh Hashanah was also intended to strengthen observance of each day. In the rabbinic view, the two days are regarded as a Yoma Arikata, one long day. Hashanah Tov. Happy New Year. Shalom. <clears throat> Rosh Hashanah, the wedding of the Messiah. The Bible is a marriage covenant. Both the Tanakh, the Old Testament, and the Brit Hadashah, the New Testament, describes how God, through the Messiah, the bridegroom, is in the process of marrying his bride, the believers in him, who will ultimately live and dwell with him forever. God ordained and established marriage and its divine sanctity in the Torah. The very first book of the Bible, Genesis, Bereshit, when he brought Adam and Eve together to become one flesh, Genesis 2, 21 through 24. In doing so, we have a vivid foreshadowing of the Messiah, being married to those who would believe upon him. Let's examine this closer. Adam is a type of the Messiah, Yeshua. Adam was made after the likeness of Yeshua, Romans 5 and 14. Yeshua, which is Jesus, who is Jesus, was made in the likeness of Adam, Philippians 2 and 8. In fact, Yeshua is called the last Adam in 1 Corinthians 15, 45 through 47. In Genesis 2 and 21, God had a deep sleep fall upon Adam. Sleep is synonymous with death. In Daniel 12 and 2, in John Yekonon 11 through 11 through 14, in 1 Corinthians 15, 51 through 54, in Ephesians 5 and 14. The deep sleep that God caused to fall upon Adam is a picture of the crucifixion and death of Yeshua as Messiah ben Yosef. God brought a deep sleep upon Adam so he could take a rib from the side of his flesh. This required the shedding of blood. This is a picture of Yeshua who was pierced in the side of his flesh, shedding his own blood when he hung on the tree. John 19.34 From the rib of Adam, God made Eve. Likewise, by the death of Yeshua and faith, Imuna, in him, God established the assembly of believers known in Hebrew as the Kihala. The believers in the Messiah, his bride, became wedded to him by faith, by Imuna. This marriage can be seen in the Tanakh, the Old Testament, as well as in Jeremiah 23, 5 through 6, as it is written. This is his name whereby he shall be called, the Lord our righteousness. That's Jeremiah 23 and 6. In Jeremiah 33, 15 through 16, it is written, This is the name wherewith she shall be called, the Lord our righteousness. Jeremiah 33 and 16. So from these passages in Jeremiah, we can see that a wedding is taking place. Therefore, by accepting, trusting, and believing in the Messiah, the bride of the Messiah, his followers, his followers excuse me, become one with him. These people would include both Jew, which is Hebrews, and non-Jews, Gentiles, who have lived since Adam and would include Noah, Abraham, Isaac, Jacob, Moses, David, and Solomon, as well as the prophets. God gave the wedding customs, service, 
and ceremonies to the Israelites, <clears throat> Romans 3 and 2, and Romans 9 and 4, <clears throat> to teach us about the Messiah Yeshua, Colossians 2, 16 through 17. <clears throat> Excuse me. With this in mind, let us examine the biblical wedding ceremony that God gave to his people. The ancient Jewish wedding ceremony God gave to the, his people to teach us about the wedding of the Messiah consisted of 12 steps. The marriage supper of the Lamb is revealed by the Hebrew wedding ceremony. Number one, the selection of the bride. Number two, the bride price was established. Number three, the bride and groom are betrothed to each other. Number four, a written document is drawn up known as a ketubah. The betrothal contract is called in Hebrew a shetre esrin. The bride must be, give her consent, number five. Number six, gifts were given to the bride and a cup called the cup of the covenant was shared between bride and groom. Number seven, the bride had a mikvah, a water immersion, which is a ritual cleansing. Number eight, the bridegroom departed, going back to his father's house to prepare the bridal chamber. Number nine, the bride was concentrate, consecrated and set apart for a period of time while the bridegroom was away building the house. Number 10, the bridegroom would return with a shout. Behold, the bridegroom comes and the sound of the ram's horn that the shofar would be blown. 11, he would abduct his bride, usually in the middle of the night, go to the bridal chamber where the marriage would be consummated. Number, I'm uh, sorry, number 11, number, this is the full marriage known as the Hebrew Nesuin. Number 12, finally there will be a marriage supper for all the guests invited by the father of the bride. On the wedding day, the bridegroom is seen as, as a king and the bride is a, qu a queen. During the consummation of marriage, the bridegroom, Yeshua, will be crowned king over all the earth and the bride, the believers of Yeshua, the Messiah, will live with him and rule with him forever. The crowning of the king and the marriage can be seen in Isaiah 62, 3-7. The unbelievers in the Messiah will attend a separate banquet where the fowls of the air will eat their flesh. This can be seen in Revelation 19, 17 through 18. In concluding this section on the wedding, whenever anyone hears the message of the Bissar of the gospel, it is a wedding proposal by God to accept him and to be part of his bride. God desires that we accept him, this invitation, and give him our response of, I do. In fact, Revelation 27, 17, and 20 is a proposal by Yahweh himself to accept him and be part of his bride. His message in the verse is, come, will you say, I do, to the Messiah's proposal to you? Revelation 22, 17, and the spirit and the bride say, come, and let him that hear it say, come, and let him that is the thirst come, and whosoever will, let him take the water of life freely. Revelation 22, 20, he which testified these things should, said, surely, I come quickly, amen, even so, come, Adonai Yeshua. Will you accept this invitation? That is, I do. See, I told you, we's married. <laughs> we's married now. All right, all right. I forgive you that you read through my part, Ed, but that's okay. Yeah, he, he threw his shofar at me. I mean, he's just gone, gone. I don't know what it is, and he, we haven't even broken open the wine yet. Oh, God. <laughs> Hallelujah. This year is a special year. It is not just Rosh Hashanah, the beginning of a new year. It is the beginning of a cycle, a new cycle, end of a cycle, beginning of a cycle. It is the Shemitah year. I'm going to read a little from uh, Leviticus chapter 25. The Lord spoke to Moses on Mount Sinai. Speak to the Israelite. Do I have any Israelites in the house, first of all? Okay, amen. Okay, Israelite people and say to them, when you enter the land that I assign to you, the land shall observe a Sabbath of Yahweh. Six years you may sow your field, and six years you may prune your vineyard and gather in the yield. But in the seventh year, the land shall have a Sabbath of complete rest, a Sabbath of Yahweh. You shall not sow your field or prune your vineyard. You shall not reap the aftergrowth of your harvest or gather the grapes of your untrimmed vine. It shall be a year of complete rest for the land. Just like Sabbath is complete rest for us, the seventh year, okay, is Sabbath of the land. Just like Sabbath reminds us that Yahweh is creator, the seventh year is acknowledging 
that he is the creator of the heavens and the earth, the land also. Okay, but you may eat whatever the land, whatever the land during its Sabbath will produce. You, your male and female slaves, the hired and bound laborers who live with you, and your cattle and the beast in your land may eat its yield. This year is the great equalizer. It technically is the great equalizer because in this year, everyone acknowledges that the land belongs to Yahweh. So if the land belongs to Yahweh, what's produced on the land belongs to him. So he is freely giving it to everyone, not just the landowner, but the one working the land, anyone coming by on the land, okay? And what is so amazing, okay, first of all, the agricultural part typically is just done in the land of Israel. So they are, have entered into, just entering into the Shemitah year. However, we know the Bible also has several layers in that it is not just the physical, but there are spiritual attributes all, all to that also. So we've been laboring hard for these six years. This next year as a year of rest is so important for people to understand. Because if you've ever gone through a cycle, have you ever gone through a cycle where it seems that nothing you do in a particular year is coming up? Okay. And it goes on and on, on and on and on and on. Oh, sorry. <laughs> on and on. Okay. And, you know, it goes month or month or month. And then all of a sudden, boom, things start happening again. And you want to know why. Then you go through this cycle again. It's because... That's why it's so important for us to understand God's timing in the Bible, all right? There is a time when he says, okay, if we go a little further, okay, we talk about a jubilee. A jubilee is seven years of seven, okay? So that 50th year becomes a jubilee year. It's also a year of rest, okay, also. But here is the thing that people need to understand. He goes on, let's see here, hold on a minute here. All right. He says that you shall observe my laws and faithfully keep my rules that you may live upon the land in security. So what is the key? See, this is what this day is about. It reminds us who our king is. It reminds us of who we are. It reminds us of the kingdom that is supposed to be governing our life, okay? And so it reminds us if we have a king, there are rules to keep. You live in America, you're going to follow America's rules. You go to Spain, okay, they have their set of rules. You go anywhere else, that country has its set of rules as defined by those who are what governing the particular land. However, if we profess to be of the kingdom of God, whose laws supersede all of man's laws he does okay his do so the land shall yield its fruit and you shall eat your fill and you shall live upon it in security why why would you do that because obedience in obedience the heavens and the earth are already pre-programmed to bring forth your blessing oh you obey here's a blessing he's already commanded the earth to spring forth so the things that you do, he's already for your obedience. He's already commanded the environment to release certain things. But for disobedience, he's already commanded the environment to withhold. And this is why when people go through cycles, I get very specific with them. Are you better off now than you were a year ago, a month ago? Okay, seven years ago. How long has have you been in this spiral? If you're better, getting better, are you better than you were a year ago, two years ago? Yes, then we're going in the right direction. If you're worse than you were, you're going in the wrong direction. So then I track and see when was the last time you were doing good? Because God forbid you get into a seven-year cycle. You are not going to break that cycle until the next Shemitah year. Okay, with that. And that's why it is so important for God's people to know his timing. So he goes and he says, and Leviticus 25, verse number 20, and should you ask, what are we to eat in the seventh year if we may neither sow nor gather in our crops? So when you sow, you are expecting a harvest, right? In the church, we're always taught, sow into this, sow into that. But here's the problem. A sower knows what seed he's planting. He knows when, what to expect, 
He knows when to expect it. We're just told, just throw it anywhere, and whatever happens, what comes up is what we accept. Okay? Y'all need to be getting your money back from some of these prophets. <laughs> but anyway, he so, so he says, if we may neither sow nor gather in grapes, then he says, I will ordain my blessing for you in the sixth year. So this year that we were in was the sixth year. He says, I will ordain my blessing so that it shall yield a crop sufficient for three years. That's like that one paycheck you got lasting you for three years. Hallelujah, glory. Okay, <laughs> nice idea, concept. But he says in that sixth year, which is why we were so zealous about doing as much as we could with a lot of different organizations. And now this is why we are seeing certain things that are just multiplying people, you know, uh, like over, especially over in Sierra Leone, the blessings that we are having. OK, over there, because the effort that we put in the last two years is beginning to pay off for us incrementally. Now, that is with that, but it's also in our personal lives. The certain things that you did, OK, will pay off for the next three years. And that's very important because everybody else may be wondering what's going on. But the people of God are not supposed to. Because what? We have a king who's given us rules. We're in a particular kingdom. We know what our ro role is. We know that he says whatever he says is forever settled in heaven. Let me tell you something. You never have to worry about false prophecy when it is the word of God who's doing the prophesying. Not, you know, prophet Hobo Jones. Or that husband you've been waiting for. <laughs> that new house you're still waiting for 20 years later. Okay, that new car that hasn't even been built yet, okay? <laughs> no, you never have to worry about prophecy. When you are reading up and it says, thus saith the Lord, this is what I will do. The only thing he says is that you trust me, do you trust me? That's what faith is. Faith means trust. Do you trust that if you do the right thing, I'm going to make sure the right thing is done by you? Okay, so then he goes, when you sow in the eighth year, so after this year, next September, will be the eighth year. Eight is the number of new beginnings. You will still be eating the old crops, okay, until the ninth year. Because you don't even begin planting until the eighth year, and the harvest time is in the ninth year. So what would happen, really, if we got in God's timing for certain things? If we got in God's timing, that's why it's so important to know the times in Abib, okay, the beginning of the prophetic month. This is the beginning of the month for you, not for the mother folk. They're rendering to Caesar. Caesar has his time frame. Don't do things in Caesar's time frame and you lose out in Caesar's kingdom. Okay, you understand what I'm saying with that? Okay, God says this is the beginning of month for you, and that is the springtime, because it is a reminder of your freedom. Freedom, okay? And then Tishrei, okay, is when he created man and gave him a job, okay? He put him in the garden to tend the garden. So that is the fruit of your hands is governed by this particular time frame. So once you get all these time frames working correctly, you know you render unto Caesar the things that are Caesar and render unto God the things that are God. And when you get that rhythm going, you're all right in both kingdoms. Okay, in both kingdoms. This is not so hard. We Our, our Torah portion last week said, this is not so hard that you got to send somebody up the heavens to bring it down or send someone to the depths of the sea. He said, no, it's right in your mouth. So the things that you are speaking, okay? So we understand that with the Shemitah year, all right, the, the Shemitah year is the great equalizer. Now, what if you haven't done certain things? The Shemitah year, is the great equalizer. He's commanded a blessing on the earth so that everybody, everybody has the same potential. You have the same potential at this particular time. What Rosh Hashanah is a reboot. Control, alt, delete. Okay. It's the heavenly control, alt, delete. The things we didn't do last year, we were supposed to do. Get over it. 
Okay, get over it. Okay, we're getting ready to start anew. We're starting anew right now. Okay, and the enemy, when we talk about judgment, the enemy wants to bring in fear because that's his kingdom. He wants to make you fearful. Okay, however, God says, No, I am your fear. The same word in Hebrew, yare, means fear to be afraid of, but it also means in reverence and awe. So the enemy will make you afraid of the things that you didn't do and expect judgment from God. But God said, watch me. He's going to do a James Brown on you. Watch me. Okay, what what I do for you? Okay, watch what I am about to do for you. And it starts with repentance. God, I'm sorry about the things that I didn't do. Get that list out of things that were undone. Flip it over to a new page. Get a new notebook. In fact, I ran out of pages in my notebook, so I'm starting a new notebook, okay, this week. So get a new notebook. Write those things out again, okay? And in this year, guess what? This year of rest, this is the year where God will give his favor. Now you'll be able to plan those things out for you because there are certain things you've been doing that are going to provide the resources that you were going to need with that. And you trust God. This is a year where he says, you rest. You can't do it for yourself. I'm going to do it for you. I'm going to show you who it is that I am during this year. So this is an awesome year for us to uh, be in. So we're going to go to our Seder. Okay, now, so if you turn to the Seder, Rosh Hashanah Seder, and to make it easy for everyone, I'm going to read, and I may call on some people, Okay, to read also. All right, so the Seder was created to welcome in the new year. It is a template meant to be celebrated, enjoyed, and adapted as participants desire. So that means it's not, okay, etched in stone. In fact, most do not have a Seder. This is very unusual, people doing a Seder. Yes, I do, because Seder means order. It means how to teach someone. So we are celebrating okay, the new year, okay, using the different, you know, emblems and icons that represent different things. So ever since the first breath of creation, time has unfolded in cycles of seven. Six days reach their crescendo in the seventh day Shabbat, the Sabbath, the day of rest. Six years reach their crescendo in the seventh year, Shemitah, the sabbatical, the year of renewal. Seven cycles of seven years reach their crescendo in the Jubilee year, the ultimate enactment of recreation, recreation. We are currently starting the seventh year of a seven-year cycle. This Shemitah year, the year 5782, will begin on September 7th, 2021 through September 26th, 2022. But just saying, this is September 6th, and biblical time begins sun down sun down so technically we're already in the seventh as a matter of fact time according to god when we look at timing it is what's going on in israel is the way you synchronize your watch it is about three let me see i'll say 325 okay in israel right now they're anticipating the new moon at uh, 351 so i have it on my clock Okay, that's when, so for them. Now, that was so profound to me because if Israel is the timepiece, we're not on Israel's timing. You understand what I'm saying? So while we're waiting for something to happen over here, it's already happened. (laughs) Okay, (laughs) it's already happened, okay, in his timing, which is why in the diaspora, it's a two-day holiday because they have to give people time to do what? know what's going on in Israel because of the differences in time. So we see all three cycles call forth nostalgic, nostalgic, excuse me, images of Eden when humanity lived in abundance, peace, equity, and ease. All offer a way of partial return, but there are differences among them. Jubilee is more fantasy than experience, more vision than practice. Why? Jubilee is when technically all debts are released. Can you imagine? Okay, Wells Fargo saying, you don't have to pay your mortgage, okay? I released your house to you. Here's the title. 
Hey, hallelujah. <laughs> okay. <laughs> All right. You know, it's when debts are released. Oh, if we were really, truly a nation under God and went by his laws, how much better would we be? Because the whole thing is with Jubilee, okay, even if you get into debt, even if you lost your house, in Jubilee, you get it all back again. It's restored. God always has a way of restoration. Even if you mess up, he already has the fix in. Okay? So we see with uh, Jubilee, uh, let's see. While it remains a part of our sacred narrative, it has nonetheless fallen out of our sacred calendar because they've stopped celebrating the Jubilee. They say the Jubilee will resume again once all the tribes are represented in Israel. Okay, in Israel. All right, I'm going to go with the microphone. Leroy, you read the next paragraph. Shabbat, that's where we are? Yes. Okay. Shabbat, on the other hand, is a constant presence. It is celebrated weekly as time apart, 25 hours of a live dream dimension. We enter Shabbat by leaving the work-a-day world and cross into a, dom a domain that is innocent, a taste of the world to come. We are at leisure, eat well, avoid strife, and pretend to create one world, diminishing the boundaries that daily divide us. Give the microphone to you. Ed, you read that next one. <clears throat> Shemitah sits between these two, neither a fantasy nor a constant present. It is both vi a vision of a new reality and practice to be lived in here and now. It happens in the same time and space as all other years, only we are to live this year differently, more equitably, more fully, more intentionally than the six years before. It is a year of harmony and celebration with the earth when the land of Israel rests from the agricultural labors imposed upon her, yet when she yields sufficient goodness for, uh, uh, for us all to strive. It is a year of commonplace manner when food is ours for the taking, but modesty temperately with a deep sense of gratitude and awareness. When debts are forgiven and there is equity for all, when property bounds are suspended and all becomes one, once again part of the commons, it is in short a year of rebooting, recalibration, and realigning our assumptions about property, land use, economic justice, and social equity, not as a dream, but as a reality. All right, Rich, you're going to read that next. I'm going to work you, Rich, because I don't get you that often. Rosh Hashanah. 2021 marks the next Shemitah year, the Hebrew year 5782. Hebrews around the world are seeking ways to enter into laws and the spirit of this Shabbatical cycle as they never have done before. They are extending its message beyond the boundaries of Israel to wherever they live and extending the thrust of its ethnic beyond the agricultural sector. To mark this moment, to help us begin this historic revisioning, renewal and re-imaging of the ways to live and the cycles of Shemitah, we offer this Rosh Hashanah Sedar. It is modeled on the Hebrew tradition of New Year's Samatinim, symbolic food like the traditional apples dipped in honey that represent the blessings we hope will be ours. The Seder consists of six small cups of bowls arrayed on a decorative base plate. The base plate represents the whole, the sweep of time, the sphere which encompasses and defines every seven-year cycle. For Shemitah is not just one segregated year, as Shabbat is not one segregated day. They are both cycles of time. It is the year that frames and gives shape to all the other years, both those just past and those yet to come. Upon this foundation plate rests the six cups or bowls. Together they represent the six attributes that define the essence of the cycle of the Shemitah year and a life lived in goodness, sacred, striving, and delight. Slices of apples and other perennial delicacies of your choice are arrayed in the center of the base plate. So you see that you can take the uh, plastic off the uh, plate, okay, so that you can see the plate, okay. And I uh, sent Brad pictures, so you can look at the pictures on Hebrew Institute of Studies 
on Facebook. Okay. Uh, let's see. Uh, these recall the fruits of Eden that sustained us and the tree of knowledge that launched us on the irresistible human enterprise of curiosity, desire, exploration, and pursuits. And they represent the perennial foods, fruits, nuts, and berries that grow on their own during the Shemitah year and that we gratefully eat at a time when we do not plow, sow, reap, or commercially harvest the produce of the field. Okay, we're going to say the blessing over the Seder together. All right. Blessed are you, Yahweh, our Elohim, King of the universe, who has kept us alive, sustained us, and has brought us to this season, and who has given us holidays, customs, and seasons of happiness and joy for the glory of our Adonai, Yeshua HaMashiach, the light of the world. Okay, so next page, we're going to say the blessing. Blessed are you, Yahweh, our Elohim, king of the universe, who brings forth bread from the earth and has become our Yeshua, the living bread from heaven. Blessed are you, Yahweh, our Elohim, king of the universe, who brings forth the fruit of the vine. Okay, what we're going to do now, pick a wine, okay, and uh, pour wine in your glass. We also are going, there are apples there, so take out a uh, pack of the apples okay and each one get an apple and also the bread we're going to break the bread all right and here's how you do the bread okay Okay, take an apple, take some apples, take a piece of the bread, and there's honey there. You can squirt some honey in your plate. Oh, okay, thank you. I'll keep one down here, you guys can keep that. Uh, yeah. Oh, that's kind of hard to squeeze. Just pour it out. Yeah, just take the top off and just, uh, yeah. Oh, that's not bad. Thank you, thank you. All right. No, I have some. I have some. Rich gave me one. Okay. Um, apples. Get a pack of apples. And I know I have some uh, dry wine there, somewhere there. Uh, wait a minute, did, did you open? Um, no, I mean any uncorked, because uh, we have some people here who don't like the sweet wine. I'm not gonna mention any names, okay? Yeah, here it is. Okay, so I tell you what, if you're gonna open a bottle of the dry wine, yeah, Canaan is dry. Yeah, that. Yeah, you can do white or red. It doesn't. It doesn't matter. Huh? That's Riesling. That's white. Yeah, you can open it. You can open it. You want red? Look up there and see if there's any red. Okay. If you want to uncork it, here is the corkscrew. The that's sweet. I know she won't. She'll throw that bottle at me. <laughs> okay. So. Um. You have to look. I think the, I'm not sure if the barking is red. Oh, okay. All right, so do you mind drinking white? Okay, so yeah, you guys can share. You can share that. Okay. Get one slice of apple. Oh, you did. You sure did. Okay, no, that's. And there's non-alcoholic for those who don't, for those who don't drink uh, um, alcohol. There's non-alcoholic wine. 
up there also. Uh huh. <laughs> There you go. They're dry. Yeah, they're dry. That's sweet, that's sweet, yeah. Thank you. Oh, pass the white over. Okay, no, I got that's all. Okay, now watch your, those bases sometimes are a little unsteady, so just make sure when you uh, pick up your glass, the base stays on. Yeah, I got dates. I haven't had a date for a long time. No. <laughs> Even though I had Sierra Leone, that's another story for off the microphone. Okay. All right, so let me know when uh, everybody is ready. All right. Okay, we're going to hold up our bread and hold up, just put the bread in your hand. And hold the wine again, and we're just going to say the uh, um, the kiddish, and that is the um, that top blessing there, again. Blessed are you, Yahweh, our Elohim, King of the universe, who brings forth the bread from the earth, and has become our Yeshua, the living bread from heaven. Blessed are you, Yahweh, our Elohim, King of the universe, who brings forth the fruit of the vine. Okay, now we are ready. Honey, okay, representing sova, I'm sorry, enoughness. Enough, everyone say that, enoughness. Sova is the feeling of fullness without being stuffed, of contentment through what was given and not wanting anything more, of maximum satisfaction with minimum consumption and disruption. This first cup is filled with honey, Okay, we passed around the cup for all to dip the apples in honey and say, okay, get your apple, dip it in the honey. All right, and everybody together. In this cycle of Shemitah, may we know no hunger, either spiritual or physical. May we be as readily sated with the delights of life as this cup is filled by these drops of honey. Okay, eat your apple. You can dip the bread in it. Hmm. The honey, by the way, that we're using is locally produced. And if you look on your tables, okay, you have three different seasons there. There's um, spring, I think spring, summer, winter, uh, um, uh, fall. Okay, you may have fall, okay, over there. Each season has a different set of plants that the bees pollinate. And each season has a different set of healing properties, okay, that go along with it. Okay, so we have all the seasons represented there. You can dip your bread in the honey, too. Mm. Enoughness. Delicious.
All right, cup number two. Wine. Consider fruit wine. It could be passion fruit wine from Israel or homemade date wine. Okay, we have wines from Israel. We have wines from South Africa. We have wines from Italy, from Germany, uh, from New Zealand. Uh, there's wines from New Zealand. So all over the world, everywhere where he has scattered his people, there are wines represented. The only continent we don't have represented is Antarctica. Those penguins just do not want to cooperate with us, okay? So. <laughs> anyway, wine signifies hodaya, gratefulness. Hodaya is the feeling of gratitude, of deep satisfaction, and exclusive peace with what we have received. Wine is the age-old symbol of celebration and expression of shared gratitude. It takes years for the vineyard to grow and produce grapes and time enough for the wine to ferment. On the human side, this requires steadfastness, peace, stability, and longevity. On nature's side, it requires cool and heat and sun and rain and rich soil all in the right amounts. Surely things to be grateful for. This cup is filled to the rim with wine. Okay, so your wine cups can be filled too. Just be careful on the bottoms there. Okay, hold it up. Let's hold up the wine and all together, let us say, in this Shemitah cycle, may we know peace and be strangers to disappointment and disruption. May the earth find renewal amid its rest. And may gratitude fill us all as the wine fills this cup. Amen. Oh, delicious. Mm -hmm. Now, which ones are you drinking over there? Oh, the blueberry from Italy? Okay. Oh, cherry? Okay, good. Okay, you got, you have the, uh, um, do me a favor. Uh, what region of Israel is that uh, Canaan from? From Galilee. Okay, so we have different regions that are represented. We have Galilee, we have Dan, we have different regions in Israel where all the tribes are. I'm trying to get, eventually, I'm going to have wines from all 12 tribes where they, where they were on our Passover, our Passover table. So, yeah, we'll be doing that for Passover. Okay, cup number three is the fig. Okay, figs representing revaya, abundance. Give me another fig. No, I'm just kidding. Okay. <laughs> abundance. Revaya is the awareness of the vast resources of a healthy world, the earth's ancient capacity of growth and self-renewal, and our call to keep it going. Figs are not like most other fruit crops. The fruit on one tree do not ripen all at once, but one by one, each in its own time. They offer abundance without surfeit. This cup is filled with figs, either whole or cut fresh if available, though dry figs are fine too. Speckled and spangled with seeds. Okay, so everyone has a fig. Okay, let's hold up the fig. Okay, and let's say our prayer. In this cycle of Shemitah, may we recognize abundance and know no waste. May we celebrate the vast goodness that lies within even the most modest cash of life. May we reverently receive life's abundance and like the continuous fruiting of the fig tree, give what we can at the time that is right. You can eat the fig. Remember, there are two seasons of figs. This fig represents from the fall feast. How you get this fig is that in the spring, there is a false fig. That's the one that when Yeshua came to the tree and he saw the leaves, but there were no figs on it. Those early figs, if there are no early figs, that's an indication there will be no fall figs. So if there are early figs in the spring, okay, there will be fall figs. There are two different figs, okay. That is why he cursed the fig tree, because it looked like it should have been full of figs. But he knew in the end it was not going to be producing. That's why even the parable of the, uh, 
a king coming to his orchard there and the vine dresser, you know, uh, the caretaker, you know, uh, he goes, look, I've been coming back three years and this tree has produced no fruit. Cut it down. So what does he say? Give me another year. Just give me another year with it. And then if it doesn't produce fruit, you can cut it down. Okay, cut it down at that time. So we have figs there. These are good. Better than Fig Newtons. And you can continue to drink the wine and eat of the others, okay? In the end, we'll be like the day of Pentecost. Only we, only we will be saying, these men are drunken, as you suppose. <laughs> Okay, our next page, guys, cup four. Raisins. Raisins representing chesed, goodness, kindness, generosity. So think about it. We've experienced enoughness. We've experienced gratefulness. We're ex we've experienced abundance. Now we are going to experience goodness, kindness, and generosity. His, hallelujah. Hesed is a response to our gratitude for the varieties of gifts we have received in this world. Having received, we are moved to give. Such is the nature of the gift. The raisins heaped in this cup signify the sweet, satisfying substance that can be given even after other extractions of goodness have been taken. They recall the leaves the juices, the wine, the vinegar, the shade, the wood, and the light that are all gifts of the great. In response to all that we have been given, we are moved to give more. So everyone's passed around and they have the, have the raisins. So get a couple of raisins in your hand. Okay. And we're going to say this prayer. Everybody, uh, let me know when you're ready. Hold your raisins up. Okay. All right. In this Shemitah cycle, may we know no greed. May we recognize the gifts we have received and in return realize the manifold ways of giving that lie within each of us. Okay, eat the grapes. Instead of pomegranates, we're doing seeded grapes because the key is the seeds. Things with seeds in them. Okay. And this is, you know, so profound. Pomegranate representing pariut, fertility. 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 Look at the eyebrows, Jenny. <laughs> Let me rebuke him. <laughs> <laughs> All right, Lena and Rich. Okay. <laughs> That's Sarah. Okay. <laughs> okay. So Poriut is the creativity, the dynamism, the fecundity, fecundity, I'm sorry that characterizes the majest majesty of nature. It is what allows us to eat during this year of fallowness and renewal. It is the dormancy that bursts forth in the right conditions, inspiring human gifts of imagination, discovery, and awe. This cup is filled with, I'll say, grape seeds, okay, symbols of overflowing fertility. So we have that. Everybody has their grape. Get your grape in your hand. Okay, all together. In this Shemitah cycle, may we know no barrenness, no emptiness. May this year of material enoughness bring forth overflowing acts of discovery, delight, and spiritual bounty. Hallelujah. All right. Cup number six is the date. Now, these dates uh, do have a seed in it, so be careful when you bite down on it. Usually, I get the ones that um, have been 
defanged, okay? Dates representing Otsar, the commons. Otsar is the earth's shared resources, owned by none and gifted to all. It is the storehouse of the ages, the fundamentals of life that we all depend upon. It is the stuff of earth and society, natural and cultural, that we share now in our lifetimes and leave behind for others. Our stories, our knowledge, our goods, our homes, our earth. This cup holds stuff dates signifying all that we share in the giving to and taking from the commons. Okay, another option is to put a few symbolic grapes, rather dates in the center cup, uh, but array them, pitted and sliced, blah, 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 blah. Okay. Now, you could stuff them with almonds, walnuts, pistachio, pine nuts that were soaked in honey and wine. So I haven't done all of that, guys. Okay. <laughs> Maybe next year. Okay. Maybe next year. Okay. But right now, we just have just plain God, God great, but rather God dates. Okay. So everyone, oh, okay, just take a date. You can dip it in honey if you want. You can stuff a few raisins in it if you need to just have something stuffed in it. All right? So everyone, let's take a date and say, in this Shemitah cycle, may we know no isolation, no loneliness, no selfishness. May we recognize that we are joined in partnership to the earth and to one another through our common heritage, the Torah, our past and our future that bind us to one another forever throughout the cycles of space and time. Okay, you can take a, uh, a date and then wash it down with the wine. I right, hold up this lachayim, everyone. Lachayim, lachayim, lachayim to life. Okay. That actually is the last part of our, our Seder there, that date. Okay. This multi layered Seder is a tradition that can be adapted to mark every year of the Shemitah cycle. On Rosh Hashanah of the Shemitah year, the seventh culminating year, all the cups are filled ce celebrating the completion of one Shemitah cycle. So what you can do to do it, each year you just put one more thing on there, like you start with the wine, that's all. Then the next year you put the next thing, the next year you put the next thing. We do all of them because we, we want the fullness, okay, the fullness every year. <laughs> okay, every year, okay. All right, so on, uh, let me see here. The following year, the first year, only the first cup with honey and the apples appear on the plate. The second year, the first two cups, the third year, the first three, and so on until the completion of the cycle and the celebration of the next Shemitah year. So this, once again, is a, it's a celebration, but is one that is customizable. There's nothing to say it's done exactly like this. And if you don't do it that way, the ground is going to open up and swallow you up. Okay. <laughs> or as we used to be told, you're going to bust hell wide open if you don't do it like this. Okay. No, it's not like that. Okay. You can have your own traditions. Okay. Along with this, because this is a very non-traditional, uh, okay, Seder. And so you can customize it to things that are relevant to your family or relevant to your culture. Okay, to the culture, okay, even. So we have biblical tests. That's your homework assignment, okay, for tomorrow. And tomorrow is a non-work day, guys. Okay, it's a day of rest. And then uh, the Shemitah is also talked about in Exodus 23, verses 10 and 11, Leviticus 25, 1 through 7, and also 20 through 21, and Deuteronomy 15, verses 1 through 6. Okay. And so anyway, that basically is what our Seder is about. So let me ask each of you a question. Who is ready? Hold on here. Who is ready for enoughness? I am. Okay. Who is ready for gratefulness? I am. Who is ready for abundance? All right, where's my drummer? Okay, my drummer and the organ player there. Okay, abundance, yes. 
Okay, who is ready for goodness, kindness, and generosity? All right, who is ready for fertility? I hear nobody raise their hand. Okay, fertility can be ideas that come to pass, things you conceive in your mind that bring forth resources to you. You understand what I'm saying? I'm ready for fertility in that. Show me the things that I need. Okay, that I need to do ideas and things. Okay, for example, over in Sierra Leone, one of the pastors was mentioning how they would have a difficulty with some of uh, preparing for this. I said, someone who is enterprising is going to get some land and plant some date trees, plant some grapes, so that they can do what? They can have all the things that are needed for the celebration, not for themselves but they also will be able to provide it to other ministries that are coming into the Torah. So, you know, having some farmland, yeah, get some uh, grapes, some pomegranates, all those things will grow over there, okay? And that way you can have that right there, just like in the promised land, okay? So, in all in all, that, that okay, is our Seder for tonight, all right? We need to just remember what this time is. It is the special time. It is the year of Yahweh's favor that we are going into. How many of us want Yahweh's favor this year? Okay, yes, indeed, we certainly do. Okay, and he has begun to do that. There are a lot of new things that are, are coming out. Leroy is, is beginning a new enterprise. Okay, we are applying for that, that grant. Okay, for uh, with Rotary, they are really bugging me about that. Okay, uh, for the uh, Sierra Leone. We're going to be doing some other things. Uh, I campaign on helping babies breathe. Okay, we want to help babies breathe. Okay, so a lot of different things. Water, I'm hoping to grab Leroy next year to go over there to talk to the Minister of Health. Okay, as a matter of fact, we're supposed to be meeting with them on a Zoom meeting um, coming up. So I'll let you know when that meeting is so that you guys can get on. Okay, uh, uh, get on that Zoom meeting with me when we're meeting with uh, some of the uh, cabinet of Sierra Leone, okay, and everything. So I'll, I'll keep you posted, you know, keep you posted on that because I want you to be aware of what we are doing, okay, internationally because it's just a beginning, just a beginning. Hopefully during this year we're going to be able to get the radio station up over there. Once we get the radio station up, we're all across West Africa. Okay, at that point, all across West Africa at that point. And uh, um, I want to be shipping some stuff from that back room over to Sierra Leone for the Bible College. So that is the goal, okay, that we have this year. And you guys are going to be going, <laughs> going over to teach. Okay, you guys have been prepared for how many years now for you to be able to go over there and teach at the Bible College. Okay, so uh, the things that you are doing you know, uh, are in preparation, are really in preparation for what it is that we are, are doing. Um, as we said, the uh, symposium was absolutely awesome. Okay, absolutely awesome. So a lot of good things that are going on. So anyway, I think you can stop the recording there. And we are going to go on to the, um, I think everybody